In the early age of sail, the line between merchantmen and warship was relatively thin. This gap grew through the late age of sail and into the ironclad and then the steel age. By the 20th century, the difference was pretty much insurmountable, but some navies did offer subsidies to various commercial shipping companies in exchange for which the commercial ships had some form of modification done, which allowed them to be more easily militarised, usually along with the contract laws that allowed the navy in question to take the ships into service in time of war without further challenge. Typically, in the 1900s and the 1910s, this took the form of strength and mounting points to allow the rapid installation of guns without any further work, which would then create an armed merchant cruiser or an armed merchant raider, which, to be honest, is pretty much the same thing, just with a slightly different mission profile. With the attempt to rules lawyer the naval treaties in the form of the carrier Ruggio having failed, and with an eye toward both withdrawing from the system entirely, as well as deceiving potential enemies as to their true strength, the Imperial Japanese Navy of the 1930s prepared a number of different plans to increase the lethality of their fleet, but then stored them for when war seemed to be likely. This would then give the impression in peacetime of a fleet with one set of capabilities, but would in theory allow the rapid upgrade of the Japanese fleet into a far more deadly formation at a speed that the enemy could not match. Into this equation came Nippon Yusen Kaisha, the Japanese mail steamship company, provider of most of Japan's large commercial shipping. They wanted to add a pair of fast cruise liners or ocean liners to their fleet. The Japanese Navy offered to provide almost two-thirds of the construction costs in exchange for quite a large list of modifications which would predispose the ships towards conversion into aircraft carriers. Compared to the baseline civilian liner design, this would include a capacity for higher top speed, additional space between the decks for cables and pipe runs, etc., tanks for aviation fuel, significantly more subdivision than was civilian standard below the waterline, and significantly less subdivision up top the former to improve damage resistance, and the latter to facilitate the creation of hangars and flight decks. More fuel tanks for the ship's fuel were also added, and there were a wide variety of other small changes. Named the Izumu Maru, or Izumo Maru, and the Kashiwara Maru, the ships were laid down in 1939, but were never finished in their liner configurations. In April 1941, before they'd been launched, the Imperial Japanese Navy exercised their right of purchase, and conversion work on the partially completed hulls began. Renamed Hio and Junyo, they would be known in a number of Allied documents as the Hayatake, Hayataka, or Hitaka class, due to a mistaken translation of the Japanese kanji characters in documents that were seen by intelligence agents. Initially planned as a kind of support carrier, somewhat akin to the contemporary HMS Unicorn and the later conversion of Shinano, the Battle of Midway's rather rapid depletion of the Japanese Navy's frontline carrier strength meant their intended use was changed once again mid-construction, although from support carrier to frontline carrier was a relatively minor difference. This resulted in a pair of ships that displaced a little over 24,000 tons standard, but with a top speed of only just about under 26 knots, courtesy of uh, just over 56,000 shaft horsepower, which drove two screws. This relatively low speed for a carrier of this size was in part the legacy of a much heavier than military grade civilian style machinery plant due to their origins as liners. The funnel was then trunked into the island as opposed to being separate but adjacent to it. As a carrier and converted liner, there was no real armour to speak of outside of some splinter-proof plating that was slapped on adjacent to the machinery, magazines and aviation fuel tanks. Defensive firepower came courtesy of the, by this point, fairly standard Japanese Navy twin 5-inch dual-purpose mount, with six of them installed, three per side on sponsons. Initially, this was supplemented by a number of triple 25mm installations, and as was traditional with Japanese ships of the World War II period, as the war progressed, the number of these 25mm installations rather rapidly increased, although their effectiveness didn't really follow, with a number of twin and single mounts installed, along with further triples. Toward the end of the war, half a dozen multi-barreled anti-aircraft rocket launchers were also made available, and these were duly installed for whatever effect they had. 
Offensive capacity came from a planned air group of around a dozen fighters, plus 18 dive bombers and 18 torpedo bombers, for a total air group of 48 active aircraft with six more in reserve storage. As time went on, the Japanese Navy was forced to lean more and more onto fighters, and by early 1943, the fighter complement had more than doubled, whilst the torpedo bombers had been halved and the dive bombers reduced by a third. Junio's combat debut came at the Aleutian Islands around the same time as the Battle of Midway, followed by extensive involvement in the Guadalcanal campaign, which included landing a critical hit on the USS Hornet with a torpedo, following this campaign up with a variety of strikes, aircraft ferry missions, and a couple of refits, one due to the submarine USS Halibut hitting her with a torpedo. Hio was often to be found accompanying her sister, but engine troubles meant that she missed a number of key Guadalcanal battle dates, although the majority of air air group was sent ashore to bolster Japanese efforts in the vicinity. Both carriers needed their air groups heavily reinforced or entirely rebuilt several times over in the latter part of 1942 and through 1943 due to losses suffered at the hands of US anti-aircraft firepower and US Navy fighters. Both ships' careers came to a substantive end with the Battle of the Philippine Sea. For Hio, this was somewhat more definitive as she was hit by two bombs and a torpedo. This she actually survived, albeit only able to move slowly, but that she was then blown apart and sunk a few hours later by an explosion caused by the build-up of aviation gasoline fumes, the exact same chain of events that had sunk Shikaku and Taiho the day before. Junyo was only hit by two bombs, and although unable to use her aircraft as a result of flight deck damage, she did make it home, but subsequently she was used as a somewhat weird-looking freighter, in the course of which she was subjected to numerous torpedo attacks by US submarines, at one point the destroyer Akikaze deliberately taking the torpedo hits herself to spare the carrier. In late 1944 she would be hit by three torpedoes, again from US submarines, and this saw her limp home for repairs that were never completed due to shortages of spare parts and labour, and she ended the war as a disarmed hulk near Sasebo, where she remained until being scrapped in 1946. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.